Hello everyone, today we talk about the Cretan Archer between the 6th and the 4th century BC, let's say classical, uh, pre-Hellenistic times. Naturally, I will talk about the Cretans also for Hellenistic warfare, about which actually we, we have much more uh, information because as mercenaries, largely they are sort of better pinpointed uh, in the quite articulated Hellenistic armies. Otherwise, of course, there is a, a general reference to archery in a political warfare that, as you know, was not particularly much about uh, missile um, weapons, but that always sort of um, displays some slinger, some archer, right? Even if, um, of course, there, there was a general contempt towards uh, missile troops. Um, and this is something, in fact, we have already addressed um, in other videos. In fact, I could make this video just about the outrage Toxota. I don't even remember whether I made it. I think I made a video about Javeliners. But we will surely have to make something a bit more, um, let's say, precise about archery uh, in classical Hellenic times in general, because it's a sort of overlooked topic and that goes in parallel with the acknowledgement that what we think as a sort of uh, standard crystallized um, uh, Hellenic phalanx uh, tactics never sort of existed or at least developed uh, continuously over time. They reached their peak fundamentally in the 5th century to eventually decline later in or at least we do not much about them, not just because Greece was... Um, at least subjected in part to um, to Macedon and lost part of its um, uh, military, but especially political autonomy. That's the reason why actually we, we know paradoxically much more about the classical um, Hellenic phalanx than the Macedonian one in its internal functioning. Because in classical times you have uh, citizen soldiers that in their essentially... Uh, a material warfare, with the uh, usual exception of the Spartans, were in fact uh, involved in their police, uh, in fact politics, uh, and would write about that. And so it, you really have uh, the stories coming from within the phalanx in combat, telling you like you know I fought against this Persian guy, or wherever the guy was from in the Achaemenid army, uh, whereas the the Macedonian phalanges were a bit like the Marian mules, right? They were essentially proletarians uh, that did not write like they fought for a living, right, under the um, essentially a monarchic government. And uh, we know much, this is true for, for the Romans to an important extent, uh, in fact, as well. And I would like to stress, in fact, how few we actually know about ancient warfare, not that we miss the the essential overall, but in fact this information, actual lack of information is very often much more telling in concrete historical terms than even specific details. You know that the Greeks did have a, also a way to conceptualize things in the same uh, idea of discipline as Thucydides explained, say at least that defines it for the, for the times of the, of the Peloponnesian War, etc. Right? Sometimes at, at alt with the um, even with the reality of warfare is true also for um, a soldier like Xenophon. And the, the Cretans are, I think, because of pop culture, you see them in video games, everybody knows more or less what the Cretan archers or, or the Rhodian slingers are just because of those easy uh, shared references. And there is sometimes a debate regarding, for example, the interaction of the sling and the bow, which was the, the most important, seemingly, for example, the, the slingers, at least the if we compare these, um, say, specialized and, and professional troops, because this would end up to be mercenaries um, from from uh, considerably uh, old times, because, you see, Crete, yes, was, was Hellenic, but it did not belong to the, to the, let's say, not just geographically, but culturally to what was considered, at, at least what we consider properly the Hellenic classical political model, right? So they these were seen even to some degree, and in fact we will see there are some influences in this regard. I added even some picture of a 
of, of an Achaemenid or Asian uh, archer be half barbarians in a way. Basically what we consider as classical times is Athens and Sparta already the um, uh, the the Aetolians, the um, the Boeotians were considered like mm, you know something a bit different from the again the the the, the, the deepest at least the sense of what we consider the the Hellenic phalangitic model, uh, and we have seen this in multiple videos. Uh, I made it for example um, a video about Leuctra that illustrates how. In fact, eventually in the fourth century, those same that same model was surpassed. How eventually the, the Macedons came into play. In fact, as a different political uh, model, it was something that in fact would surpass the the classical phalanx. And that technically was not about another phalanx. Right? The mistake that people tend to do is considering uh, Macedonian tactics just as a as an evolution of the Oplitic ones. They have absolutely nothing to do with that. That's a combined arm, something that the, the um, again, the classical Greeks did not have. Um, and in fact, when you look at this missile troops, what, what you realize is that they were not just the spies, but objectively they hadn't had the possibility in that specific society to, to have any significant relevance. It's just during essentially the 4th century BC, the late 5th, that Greece sort of um, um, overflows. At least you have a, an Athenian telesocracy, you have um, certain specific militaries needing to operate in different territories, also to hire, in fact, uh, mercenaries, people who would be out there and that wouldn't need to come back uh, I mean, on, on the on the frontier and you know, and the campaign theater, and not uh, having to come back after a few um, time to back to their fields, and you know the transformation, in fact, of, of the classical world that, that stemmed from that. So the Cretans, the Rhodians, come into play because while being Greek, they do have, as we've seen, the sort of um, fringe. Um, uh, location and especially social background, mostly of, in fact, as islanders, shepherds, this is something you see even for the Balearic slingers, for example, that apparently, this is the most common explanation for explaining this guy's um, uh, missile um, specialty, were uh, pretty much uh, dedicating themselves to, um, in fact, this typically shepherds, um, you know, uh, weapons, you know, practice, uh, and that would allow them in, in the center uh, of the Mediterranean to be hired by interested uh, powers, right, and that would pay them also considerably to go abroad and to make a living out of it, and uh, considering also in part the, the piratic lifestyle, the um, this is not just about you know being guys being uh, you know spending their lives about watching over sheep and magically becoming um, uh, cat. I mean, it, it was also about that. I mean, stealing other people's cattle. This you know a ha a habit to killing somebody every once in a while is completely normal. But it, it's also the so the, the broader attraction of, generally speaking, poor populations. I mean, if you look at the roads, it's one of the great um, polis of, of, of ancient Greece. But in general, the, the countryside, the, the interland, is something else. Um, and these, um, let's say, the depressed people tend to make great mercenaries. This is true, in fact, also for, for the other, especially the northern Hellenic um, our realities. This is true for also the uh, the the Anatolian interland to some to some degree, um, with the difference that, however, they are part of the same Hellenic background in the again strictly political sense that they do belong to an orderly community with some you know rights or degree of representation. Um, and therefore, they are sort of more confident. They are also individually more uh, valuable in a way. It's fair to say that the Cretan archer was, um, even in his relative misery, a, a better off individual in, in a general sense than, I don't know, somebody from the, the, the interland of Asia Minor, right, under uh, Achaemenid rule. 
these are just liminal concepts. They're not so important uh, to the story. Being Greek, of course, was um, an important uh, gate gateway to further interaction with the, not just very effervescent people that was, as you know, um, blessed by the uh, the location, by the by their land, by this connection with many other on the fringe of the great ecumenic uh, ecumenic empire, and emerging with a with a moral ro- load in these centuries that was able, in fact, to challenge the same uh, Persian um, uh, uh, sovereign and and succeeding in their um, in their in their homeland, right, to, to defend uh, the same. And in in um, in general, we get to know about these populations because, of course, they are better documented to to some extent compared uh, to other people, right? Um, it's fair to say that Cretans were specialist archers in the Hellenic armies. Um, they used differently from the the Hellenic uh, archers, like of the Hellenic uh, mainland, at least composite bows, right, which were also fairly large and used uh, an, an arrow similar in size to the Persian one, but with a broad head still. Of course, the Persians would have broad-headed arrows, but since the, the Cretans would be used in this era in which, on average, the, in fact, the, the Atlantic um, warrior would be better armored in general, like the necessity of being a bit more devastating at impact or just piercing like more likely equipped opponents like it could be instead in the broader um ecumenic case was um was a thing. I should point out actually that um Xenophon uh, tells us that during the Anabasis after the Battle of Kunaxa when it were um as you know constantly disengaging for the pursuing Persians in their march um, to the sea, the Cretans, first of all, made an excellent job in, in fact, this uh, elastic um, uh, defense, right, withdrawing and allowing, in fact, the, the, the Greeks to, um, to to get out of there safely. But they apparently did suffer from uh, having no body armor, which is, in this case, compared to the uh, to the Achaemenid forces uh, that were, in this sense, more habituated, at least to some sort of, at least greater importance of um, archers in their warfare, making these, on average, um, more armored. Something we have seen so far just in Assyrian warfare that in many ways would be, like in the essentials, continued, especially in arms and armor, uh, by the Achaemenids, like in a general uh, concept and style of war, um, the Greeks instead despising archers, um, having like we we tend to see the the Hellenic uh, political warfare as ah these are democratic citizens right they thought of themselves as part of modern republics rock right the, even the Hellenic hoplite was uh, again with the usual exception of the Spartan that was also not this uh, enormous match individually because most of, of their effectiveness was about collective training um, and to again uh, like uh, we will talk about I, I made a video about the Spartan drill telling the truth um, there's nothing to take from away from the Spartans of course but to, speaking of the average Hellenic Oplite is by the historical definition an amateur right they con- the, the Indeed, the Greeks conceived the fact that of fighting continuously just being a barbarian a lifestyle, and since they were instead spiritual superior, they had something like the polis that had, in a way, again, won in terms of individual uh, liberty over the, the tyrants and their um, uh, sort of slave subjects, right? But in their mindset, they are very far from considering themselves as simply, um, you know, some sort of um, average guy. Like, we are all equal, whatever. They are actually very chivalric-minded. Take away the, the strictly equestrian meaning of, of the same. But these, even the, the again, the last uh, um, hope lie from, from, the, from the rare 
ranks is fixated since childhood in a sort of monomaniacal way with such a serial um you know uh psychopath like like achilles right and uh this is what also one of the the few good things that he might uh you know, his force showing that every single idiot can smash himself against an enemy and getting himself killed. Like, that's not actually the prerogative. And and these Greeks, um, like these hoplites, would actually do it way more often um, than we think. Um, there wasn't that sort of post-Vietnam trauma uh, made up idea of the the the, op- the oplites all rigidly compact together, woo to anyone who abandoned the formation. It was actually a much more dynamic thing. Surely yes similar to that thing but um not to the uh, extreme and crystallized extent that that we think and so the idea however is of course and this is always an important distinction to stress in strategically is that heavy infantry is decisive right here at least uh it is in the sense that cavalry is not decisive the hellenic um say culture is in this political sense indeed designed against the late Bronze Age um, sort of uh, chariot aristocracy of some sort, in, to some extent, even though the, the Greeks, to, to an important degree, are also during this time, especially in the colonies across the Mediterranean, are fairly fixated, even there with the usual universal symbolism of the wind glory leading the, the chariot, um, uh, say the of, of the hero, like in just in the Bronze Age warfare, um, Iliad lifestyle. Um, but he loads as such also the lesser element, which is by definition also not um, uh, non, um, non-decisive, that can go at war just with uh, the bow or, or the sling, right? Um, except we always see in... Atlantic battles here and there some sort of missile element that uh, does not escape like if, if you have ever studied Atlantic warfare you know that there is never such a thing like the theoretically categorical uh, image that we have created of just two thickly packed phalanxes clashing against one another and that's it, right? There is always here and there an exception. The, the phalanx is ordered in a different way from one another. There's some asymmetry. There is cavalry here. There is missile uh, um, guys there. There are different maneuvers that even accidental because actually the, you know, the, the oplitic uh, levels at this point are not meant properly even just to, to maneuver or, or whatever. It's actually much more primitive and simple way of war than we can think. We, for example, think that... Um, you know, the Achaemenid army was more backwards towards the system. Absolutely not. Like, the, the Achaemenids had a, by far, a much more developed military culture. They they had a much greater collective training, whatever. They were absolutely superior during the time of the Persian Wars in absolute terms to the, to the Hellenic way of war. But, of course, warfare is declining in different ways, and the Greeks surely win because it's mostly about moral forces and how these are declined also in that case, very far away from the center of Achaemenid power. And again, chapeau to the Greeks. We are all children of the Greeks to uh, to, to a massive intellectual extent as Westerners, no doubt. But exactly for this, we have to understand exactly what they were, right? Also in their, in their limits uh, that did not prevent them, in this case, to score one of the most important achievements uh, in the history of mankind, or just of Western civilization. Um, and as we were saying before, it's only when, in fact, the Greeks surpass this sort of seasonal, provincial, and amaterial dimension of warfare that they start needing someone who can not just stay at war longer, but that also can, uh, in fact, um, exploit the limits of the same phalanx. Um, uh, you know, that there are many examples I could throw in, but then we, we have to digress in their context, and I can't. But just to make an example, you do not need um, a Roman legionnaire to take down a Spartan hoplite. A, a, a dirty, squalid pelt is, is enough, right, in, in, the, in the right circumstance, especially, um, you know, some mountain pass, right? So this is, of course, always 
still about context, um, as it was just saying, right? And this is also true because the Greeks have to start coping against peoples that have substantially important missile warfare during the aforementioned Anabasis. Xenophon tells us that uh, the 10,000th met with while marching um, through Asia, the Karduki that are possibly uh, or even likely the uh, the ancestors of, of the modern Kurds, having missiles that would be able to penetrate the same Hellenic armor, right? And that quote had um, bows nearly three cubits long and arrows, in fact, of more than two cubits, which went through shields and breastplates. The Greeks used them as javelins when they took them. Right, this is uh, the, the Anabasis 4.4 uh, 4 to 28. Um, and this is a very interesting information because it shows you how, um, like, modulated and sort of different, even the, like, uh, in this case, even into what was used from by, by composite bows, etc., could vary in terms of projectiles, um, whatever. The Cretans seem to have, had, again, a, had a Aside from the the generalities of the uh, simple bow used by by the by the say the other Greeks on, on our age, um, in fact, pretty standard ways of uh, you know of archery. Again, it doesn't matter how prized these troops could be, they would always perform this sort of light. Um, operations and the uh, the heavies the hoplites were always the guys who uh who had the uh, you know who had the upper hand uh there was cavalry admittedly again but still again in these cultures cavalry is not decisive we made multiple videos about uh oplitic warfare we'll keep making this so you will understand ever better what um, uh, what these uh, ratios of strength were concretely about. However, it's fair to say that among the same Greeks who generally despised uh, archers and slingers, that even at least in the Hellenic uh, mainland were also weaker because the uh, the the political um, states of of this region were stronger, and so there was a greater um, you know, compactness of phalangitic warfare that would crush further the um, the the missile. It was also much more easily chased by by cavalry bodies of which uh, were were out there from quite an early date and sort of you know more frequently than, for example, on these on these islands in general. The Cretans, as the Rhodians, had a reputation for this for their missile warfare. Um, they were paralleled with, um, say, in an Hellenic perspective, even with some barbarians. I mean, they were not considered as such, but militarily speaking, when you look at these peoples who lived at the margins, such as the Thracians, the Scythians, well, the Rhodians, the Cretans, were seen a bit like guys who came from that broader frontier. In fact, it seems there to have been an important influence from the same Levant. Some people say, like, the uh, the bow came mostly from Scythia as a composite, etc. Yes, there were some, like, that. that's in general, like, where uh, this kind of weapons had been enhanced um, and developed dramatically, but let's say that at this point, the Levant broadly meant is producing this kind of weapons, and the um, and influence, in fact, this kind of uh, of troops. I made videos recently about the, for example, the Achaemenid Marines. We've seen how even strongly influenced in turn were by by the Greeks, but how they also brought their own military um, influence in in the other direction. So sh surely, like the Cretans, the Rhodians were somehow more exposed than the Hellenic uh, mainlanders, right? Um, the thousands of non-hoplites present at the Battle of Plataea in 479 definitely played a little role in the fighting, but they are still there. Um, by 424, Athens has still no formal core of such like troops. But it's, again, from the 
the time of the Peloponnesian Wars that you need to have um, more of, 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 of these guys to intercept like other enemy, also barbarian contingents, damaging cavalry, and just supporting uh, the, the phalanx, as had it always happened in a political warfare since its uh, inception, right? There had always been uh, a bowman, right? Uh, and more, of course, uh, basically, standardly, next to the to the phalangites uh, in Atlantic warfare. Um, there is also a later tradition, doesn't matter how sort of non- um, verified but especially non plausible it is that shows how uh, the Cretans in particular were attributed with some kind of general military ingenuity for example Pliny the Elder okay it's again a much later um, source the natural history 7 uh, 201 states that it was the Cretans who had invented the catapults right um, this is not true I made a video about the origin of the early um, artillery and uh, the, of course, indeed, there was a debate there where this has stemmed from. There was a broader Atlantic war that was toying with that. The, the, actually, the main field of application in those early times was Italic warfare by some Hellenic engineer that was fighting for, for the Romans. Th those were actually, even though they wouldn't make more use of siege engines than the, the Greeks or the Carthaginians for a long time, actually, the guys that uh, fighting against the Oscans in some siege warfare in, in Italy made use of this first technology. Um, it's uh, like at least it's non um, obvious why the Cretans should have been the first ones to invent the catapult, if we can so call um, some. It, it's really nobody can demonstrate that, but the same source goes on saying that the Syro Phoenicians were um, attributed the invention of the ballista. Uh, and this link, even like this link was not, so again, Pliny is just, uh, you know, th this is not true, like it's a later compilation. But it does show, however, that there was some tradition attributing to these areas, surely a development at least of missile warfare, broadly meant, this is what it means, and considering especially the uh, islander lifestyle, like and their piratic lifestyle, etc., I wouldn't. Uh, underestimate especially naval warfare, the, uh, the the historical development, even think about during the Middle Ages, um, at sea of, of crossbow uh, technology, etc., that could be connected in part, among the other things, with the fortune of not just the Cretans, but also the Rhodians, so not just um, uh, bows, but uh, um, slings, which Again, the, the composite um, bow is is, um, is a relevant aspect. Like we know that these troops were uh, kept um, uh, being used by the Romans among their auxilia. So it's something that went on for centuries. It is true that technically there were many more peoples that fought like that than we think. So again, this is mostly an Hellenic perspective, at least in in the way we can reconstruct it from the classical sources, um, but. I explained this, for example, in the video about the Levantine archer auxilia of the Roman army, that these Levantines were actually not Levantines. Like, we have these impression that the Syrians, that yes, there were some important traditions among the Syrophoenicians in, war, in um, missile um, warfare, but let's say not only, and um, certain designs, even of helmets, etc., associate with, again, the, the Syrian archer auxilia were actually people from the Balkans, right, and um, and um, do not underestimate in, in there the Iranian influence of the steppe, and in fact, as we were saying now, in, in the development of the same bow from Scythian times, I made a video about Eurasian steppes, Warford sort of explains this uh, from the, the very origins of, of, of this technology. So, there's surely a lot of, uh, of interaction in that sense, and the Koreans would be also more exposed um, um, even though I do not have specific information about them being hired by um, Asian powers um, so that again these the, those countries would have again their own um, composite uh, bow 
uh, meant and that they would use in fact visually very important traditions uh, in the same Levant right um, as I was saying at the beginning there was um, a general um, debate about the effectiveness of archery over uh, slingers in classical warfare at least theoretically in fact the Cretan archers could be outranged by the Rhodian slingers but we do not have the precise data at least it seems that the slingers in antiquity were sort of more performing than, than archers to some extent but it's not about the technology most it's about who these guys were um, and so it, it gets to, to a much greater level of um, let's say at a unit level for example that has so many factors uh, in front of which technology is practically irrelevant. Uh, in any case the Cretans were widely recognized as being definitely amongst the best light missile troops in ancient times, even beyond our today's timeline. Um, we see uh, on the wake of Alexander uh, the, the Great's um, conquest in the East these archers in fact um, being used by both the megas and many of the the other koi and that's why i was saying at the beginning that we'll have to uh, again today we'll look at just the classical greece and then we'll um, expand of course in hellenistic warfare better without mentioning that these lighter troops had very often like great um let's say survival sort of self supplying self sufficient capacities that um other especially heavier um troopers like the hoplite that was the men at arms basically could not even be spent for like their day of fine he would be utterly exhausted these guys exhausted themselves in other ways for example during the aforementioned uh, anabasis the cretans um cut off from supplies were able to gather and reuse the spent accumulated arrows as we've seen before while seizing bowstrings from local peasantry right and these um, materials were not that easily available everywhere you needed some sort of again technical capacity as well again the connection here even with certain kind of broader technical background maybe connected with maritime warfare and experience surely surely is present right um at this point xenophon says that the the cretans were out ranged by the achaemenid archers again they had they were suffering losses also because they, were, they as we'll see now better were practically not armored which was again is also kind of normal for missile troops again that the persians have this different uh, at least in, in the elite missile element sort of philosophy that again the greeks don't have because if you in greece you can uh, get better equipment you will use it for, for another type of combat and in fact this is why in fact that the greeks here are in asia and they're uh, experiencing this asymmetrical issues but at the end of the day the greeks were also the finest elements as you know the greek mercenaries of the Achaemenid army think about alexander's uh, invasion um, of persia like the the first um, engagement like the the toughest troops he had to fight against were the the same atlantic mercenaries um so being less at missile warfare is you know definitely better than being less at you know heavy infantry or heavy armed warfare in the in the first uh place right um the the cretan eurybatas was the toxarch so the the captain of the of the archers in the army of alexander the great which as we will see better again in the video about hellenistic cretan archers is is quite telling but it's where it begins right and so you see there already a, 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 a and still of course and uh, um, they would continue as we've seen for centuries a cretan primacy uh, of some sort 
um, there had been during the Persian Wars, of course, a, a great a need to balance the Achaemenid missile troops, right? The Achaemenids had some sort of greater cavalry capacity um, than the Greeks, for sure, made of it about the Achaemenid heavy cavalry. They, however, had on average um, not as heavy infantry as the Greeks did, right? They could access some of the best um, sort of medium um, uh, infantry from the mountaineers of, of, of the Mashrek, uh, very agile forces, very warlike, more barbaric, like from, from a Greek perspective, which means actually more dedicated to violence on a regular basis than the average Hellenic hoplite. But again, here, like you have the, the political rationale of the Hellenic uh, city-states that is emphasizing instead some sort of greater um, uh, political cohesion and self-determination and collective training and uh, overall unity of, of command when it comes to, to infantry, like that, uh, in that sense, qualitatively, um, uh, surpasses the the recommended one that again as a as a military machine is actually instead superior the than to to the to the Atlantic one overall. Um, there is also another function of missile troops that of course is connected with siege warfare that overall the Greeks also through the development of their own of their own uh, city walls and military engineering as a wall. Towards the end of this period, the same Greek powers were providing themselves with um, specialized contingents. Uh, we see it, for example, in the Macedonian army, at least in the first phases in, of the invasion of Asia, but again, we are already like beyond uh, classical warfare, of course, right, already like, since ever. I mean, the, the, the Polis had had some kind of specialists in this field, so say connected with uh, missile capacity of some sort on their own, right? They wouldn't rely just on the Cretans, but they were available. They could be purchased, so it wasn't much of a one issue to integrate than these forces overall. Because um, what mattered was the fact that, again, these guys were sort of professionals in their own regard. They were specializing just in that type of warfare. And uh, definitely the, the Atlantic mainland one was, was more advanced. So these guys, again, would find job in these richer places in the first place. Uh, of course, the bow, the toxin, was um, a weapon known in Hellas from the most ancient times you find it in the in the Iliad uh, in the Odyssey um, it was however considered uh, as we are as we already know a secondary weapon right of lesser importance in warfare and again even depreciated um, not just because in fact there was a stigma concerning the, the fact that it had uh, mostly come to be developed by Bar the barbarians, but because again the, the, this chivalric um, mentality, like it allowed the, the to 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 hit your enemy at a distance without um, fighting in melee like a true man. There is a hint of this in the Iliad because Paris is the Hector is is the hero actually kills most people in disproportionately in the entire poem, but Paris that of course is the guy who causes the, the whole problem uh, with Menelaus and and, uh, and Helen um, actually kills um, an important amount of people compared to other heroes um, with with a bow, right? And the idea that the Trojans in that sense from the Asian side would be also more about this because he's also kind of the only one that, um, that finds that way sort of um, shows like the, you know, the, the sinner, the guy who uh, causes the world problem, but also it's not really irrelevant in the world picture, also in terms of of kills, does use the bow, right? And if you read Tertius, okay, we are in the sort of archaic phase of, of phalangitic development, but of politic development to be more precise. 
but he talks to us about uh, bowmen and he doesn't for example talk about the spear as the first weapon but the sword still because of course at that time the the political phalanx was not yet um, mature not there was something teleological or deterministic about that which again would be fully accomplished in that within the peak of it in the in the fifth century um, Strabo um, Plutarch um, talk about this uh, covert nature of, of, of the bowman simply because again uh, it was not like it was just an inferior type of warrior in the first place all right it was not decisive and, and nowhere essentially uh, missile weapons not even in the steps were decisive in spite of all the relevance that the, the bow could have even symbolically even just as a type of um you know training for example the same uh or the sales the same ulysses as you know when he comes back home he's the only guy who can draw the the bow of, of the king it's it feels like connected with kingship but the the odyssey is also a bit more pelasgian and less indo-european than the traumatically brutal iliad in the first place but at least it, these are the same heroes of the trojan war so you can see there a bit the sort of the various influences and the fact that in the Aegean, even if it was also crete right and uh the kind of archers that it was able to produce um and uh, there were surely other places where in fact uh, the art of of archery developed but crete was truly like a, a center of this we don't have to think just uh rough shepherds um you know putting this to practice because they used to shoot at birds with that like you know it's not really how it simply worked it was always a you know an important promiscuity uh between warfare and hunt for examples because you can't really draw the line there um we are however showed archaeologically that the, the almost totality of Hellenic arrowheads find um uh, are in concept are in crete right and in fact uh the same literary references to the cretan mercenary archers um accompanying regularly the the Atlantic armies confirm as a general picture so we never think that um archaeology is more important than uh historiography historiography largely overwhelmingly is reliable and archaeology most of the time is not sufficient alone just to give give you the, the explanation of what literally historiography tells us and that it that is you know in spite of the the best skepticistic moral relativism of the, the modern times uh, repeatedly reconfirms its validity in the history of mankind slapping pretty loudly in the fa in the face any oh we need the material proof of this right spirit is way more important than that read historians read people in the past because you're severely more stupid and incapable than people who lived in the past remember that when you open a history book um so initially the Cretan bow um was surely not so big um it was used um at shorter range for like direct fire sort of point blank but um Xenophon uh, in the Anabasis 3 417 tells us that the Cretans had learned uh, from specifically the Persians, so here the, the Eastern influence, to shoot with the bigger, in fact, Persian bow, right? And work this learned from the Persians. I mean, they had been influenced by that kind of warfare, and uh, that's how also they had become more um, specialized in that, even because they were already making a living out of that, and so they began to, to develop further this, this ability, right? There was sort of this more uh, um, archuated um, parabolic trajectory that increased considerably the range, um, like the, and also just the, uh, the, the, the capacity of carrying that out with volleys, zone, uh, fire that was, as you know, in... Um, 
in warfare the most important type of of um, of tactics uh, missile speaking I mean you, you throw these volleys they have to concentrate the volume of fire onto a specific target screw precision be accurate and try to in interest of time to concentrate as much of these projectiles in a single moment right because that makes much greater damage than the exact same amount of projectiles diluted in the same exact amount of time between a bullet and another, right? And uh, again, if you, if you hit the same amount of people, hitting them all at the same time uh, is the most important thing because the damage is primarily psychological and only secondly uh, material in warfare, as always. Um, so in the 4th century BC, you see essentially again this Achaemenid bow being the Scythian one in if you go back um, but true in fact this oriental medium not the general I mean there could have been actually throughout the same Greece some sort of Scythian influence in archery development this could have not really been otherwise because that's where most like a you know that uh, technical developments were coming from uh, this is overlooked also, for example, for uh, war horse breeds, and um, that's a topic we need, that a conversation we need to have, really. Uh, I address it a bit in the videos about the Salian cavalry. But it's also true that at this point, the Achaemenid influence in Hellenic warfare, even before the Persian wars, were was very strong. So technically, the Achaemenids had yes, emerge. I mean, the maids did, you know, from essentially from Scythia themselves, but let's say there had already been a capacity of, and we've seen it for Assyrian warfare to just to foster a robust archery tradition, getting the technology from from the steps, and more so, again, there was a mix, a balance of, of, of influences um, in general, right? The composite bow, you know, what it is, it's basically made up of different materials glued together there is a, a a wooden sole that basically constitutes the like the basic structure then you, you would add from an internal side so the one that gets bent from your side when you when you draw the bow uh, that is made of horn um, and so uh, and, and on, at the, in the external side a series of animal tendons stra strata and so if you combine these materials like that you basically improve the resistance because uh, the horn inside is the one that has to bend the, the most like it has to, to get more pressure in itself so you have to resist the most the tendon instead can sort of it's more elastic it can be extended outwards the most um, this um, improves essentially the resistance to the solicitations in a selective way in the different parts of, of the bow um, and the fibers of the tendon resisted effectively to the tensions of traction external part the horn again offers this uh, excellent resistance of compression internal part um, and in order to be used that the bow had to be drawn uh, by making leverage on your legs, by the way, like bending it from the sort of the relaxed position to the, um, say, short configuration, if you can so call it, in order to allow the application of the string that was normally constituted of animal bowels, um, I would, as we were talking about before speaking of the Cretans like searching in Asia locally for this the in fact bow strings like these were not materials you could find literally everywhere that's something we um, uh, like at least animal bowels you have to treat them in a particular way etc so that's something we get tend to to overlook in, in warfare like okay this you know it's easy and just to make um, a catapult string would have no you, you need literally Asian women hair to do that you can't quite do that like a, a handball in front of Rome um, could have not like besieged the city among the other things because it did not have artillery readily available among the, the other strategical and logistical concerns and and you could not really just build like everything immediately 
uh, everywhere. It's interesting, I, I refer to this because as we've seen the Cretans were referred to even as having had some sort of connection with early catapult development. Um, and, and, and we've seen how essentially the uh, made a video about the, the belly bow, right? The, the gastrofetus uh, being essentially just a bow with a guide, right? So it's, it's of course it's a crossbow to some extent, but it's still the same thing of a, of a bow in a, in a different way. So all these know how all these know the technical capacities were part of that same specialty overall. Knowing how to use a bow is it's not easy. Right, the, the belly bow, in fact, is easier to use. The the bow requires more training and, and a long time in practice. And again, the Cretans were specifically um, specializing with this. It's a bit like it's not even to say that every Cretan knew how to do that. Actually, we we tend to forget how, especially the early archaic hoplites, were likely considering their lifestyle, the fact that they had horses they rode on them to battle and they were fairly aristocratic they they went hunting etc they surely knew how even to use a bow from horseback this is absolutely normal throughout the entire uh, the entire european history um the sanitary one right um so some guys would just be better at that and the, the reasons why the cretans again were sort of the cretans meaning in general people from crete some people from crete not all the cretans for some strange reasons is is, is social in nature, right? Is um, it just doesn't have much to do, probably even with the strict development or you know know-how of strictly geographically Crete and archery. It's like saying, uh, I don't know, think about the English armies of the Hundred Years' War. For some reason, there are lots of people who still believe the completely nonsensical notion that the Welsh allegedly would have been any better or worse than the English at archery. Um, since modern people are stupid and obsessed with technologism and the idea that a people is more stupid than another, they even went as far as saying that the Welsh had taught the English how to use uh, the longbow, um, that of course was actually a weapon used everywhere in Europe and also made in the same exact identical way every single where since prehistory. Um, because they can't think that um, there may be a reason why there were so many Welsh in the uh, in the archers of the English Indian Church, the, the Hundred Years' War, simply because the Welsh just were poor and uh, just a subjected people uh, to the English. And so there would more regularly be guys who would go out to war for a living. And actually, English archers were even better renowned, of some, especially of the royal forests, and even paid more for, for that matter. Um, so th that's how myths are uh, deterministic. Um, teleological myths are created in people's minds, but we have to train ourselves to be much more open-minded in the actual meaning of the word, which doesn't mean to be a, um, you know, a morally relativistic leftist that accepts any uh, nonsense as moral scientific truth, but actually, in fact, what this really is, that is being able to integrate knowledge in a pregressed amount of consolidated moral and scientific higher education and information and capacity of criticizing it analytically which of course has nothing to do with the further the, the previous predicament so um this um uh, this is also what we have to think about the credence overall um and so before making this video i was actually thinking like well, you know i have to stress also how these cretan archers were aside from this characterization pretty much like another Hellenic archer just of course there were composite bows in in the Hellenic um, uh, terra firma right there were uh, composite bow and pretty much everywhere in, in Hellenic culture but just prevalently you would have the, the simple European bow and again not particularly developed archery um, the the Cretans are just like a, like an accentuation of this other character, but that, uh, that a character that was already present, pretty much um, around uh, in general. Uh, for the rest, how would this Cretan archer look? Um, 
accordingly we can think that equipment um, would vary considerably even though light infantry is mostly bare like it doesn't have much equipment in the first place in fact the same Cretans who accompanied the ten thousands of, uh, of Xenophon had no body armor as we've seen before they were vulnerable to um, the Persian arrows they however carried the round pelta which was in this case in, in that campaign at least made of bronze it would have not been even necessarily typical of that I mean the the ten thousands were mercenaries so um, so the Cretans were in general and these were Cretans as well but um, the, the the pelta was sort of a smaller shield and not necessarily shaped in a way that different than another that's mostly circular um, uh, then yes I know that there is the concept of, of the pelta that later evolves um, in another thing but because the type of trooper evolves in another direction but that's also another and the type of tactical specialty because otherwise there would have been even at that time of the of the peltas sort of to offer I still credence would use the pelt that was actually as sort of buckler or again a small round shield of sort um, but this would have been otherwise of sort of cheaper material um, you would have had leather weaker even uh, and this offers you like a minimal protection it mostly um, uh, commodities you want to have in hand-to-hand -hand combat in fact at some point these guys would be used even as scouts as um, uh, troops that you would m engage against other light ones against other archers in some context so it would have not been strange uh, for a Cretan to have in the sense of some sort of um, you know primary weapon for hand-to-hand -hand combat a knife whatever also because as we've seen these guys were skilled in recovering material here and there they were rough people shepherds they were habituated to skin animals people just find whatever they want that they needed out there around um, so they had their tricks their way of, of going naturally these guys knew how to use as we've seen I mean, especially in the case of specialists people that were hired in in contexts of um, polyurcetic uh, military, you know, um, uh, units, the uh, the the like the capacity of I, I don't know using, for example, flammable projectiles, knowing how to operate some catapults, stuff like that. So other, tr other tricks that we do not know, different types of arrow heads. Uh, it's likely again that. Um, archers who were like in, in this Hellenic context uh, habituated to fight against hoplites would be sort of more skilled in uh, you know causing damage to to armored opponents uh, which does which means in some cases having specific arrow heads designed to create more to make more damage um, to armor but also just having a different type of tactical employment, if anything, especially getting around the, the phalanx would have been the, the ideal, but then there would have been from the other side other archers, and so that's also why you need that bit of uh, melee weapons, because you may never know how you get yourself um, into in, in combat. Um, the general look was... they, they wore tunics, um, Again, they didn't need uh, heavy equipment, or some maybe did. I mean, the guys who fought in Asia, for example, if there was some, uh, as we've seen, Persian armored troops, uh, surely some of those uh, Anabazes, Cretans would have taken some of it. Uh, so it would have not been strange. But again, that also entails um, what you have to do with that. You just have to protect yourself and how. like Because being light for light infantry means uh, like being protected by speed getting uh, the hell out of danger faster as opposed to uh, it's just a gamble either you bet on protection and get heavier but you you so can run away less easily and still you're potentially um you can be hit like it's up to you uh just it, it's sort of a tougher life to be to be a lighter trooper than 
uh, being uh, a hoplite. All right. Even though the hoplite has a specific uh, panoply, physique, mentality, whatever, it's just more of a privileged guy, the archer is not. Um, of course, the ar some archers could be like the Cretans as specialists and whatever, but still they are not throwaway troops. Uh, some sort of more expendable ones in in general compared to the heavier oblite, right? Otherwise, these again are among the missile troopers as mercenaries as Cretans, the, the best ones you can find overall. Um, there are the Rodian slingers, as we were saying, that maybe are better, but more or less they are uh, at the same level conceptually. A tunic could be of different colors. We we know of red, for example. Um, uh, in, as in the case of the ten thousand uh, uh, in the let's say the, the Cretans in the the, ex the Anabasis expedition, and um, this is pretty much it. We could stress other, let's say, cultural aspects. There is definitely always a lot to learn. Specific instances of. Cretan archer use that, however, mostly applies to Hellenistic times because of combined arms tactics, something that you do not really see in a political warfare, or at least um, that is not documented, because these troops were just auxiliaries uh, of some sort of the heavies, and they do not get a bad, um, say, they do not get a, a good press in general, even when they are, uh, they are professionals like these ones they are still fundamentally like neglected because they're not the proud noble uh, at least morally speaking hope light that is the the hero of the situation that in his mindset always remember he is kind of it, imitating achilles even though he has nothing to do now with the warrioristic professionalism of bronze age heroes right that were just a completely different thing, but also in a time in which, in fact, the phalanx uh, did not quite exist to the degree in which it existed at this point. Um, so it's um, always interesting to toy with these ideas, explaining like the the various dichotomies uh, to what exactly would these um, concepts um, correspond. And it's um, it's also interesting to cover specific topics, specific units, and looking at them in uh, in detail. Like uh, especially in this case for classical times, then switching to um, the Hellenistic ones, right? And I think this is like interesting because. It shows you how, in fact, that war for change. You have the same units, but they have a different coverage in the sources. They have different um, sort of role, tactically speaking. Uh, and they're essentially very simple types of troops. Again, um, I always get the impression that war game, mystically speaking, people tend to to be much more fixated with differences from ancient uh, world or medieval like sort of warfare because it's actually it's easier to get competent about that than modern warfare and so but they overstate just because they think that there is some deep science behind that that all these these various units uh, an archer one from another but if, when, when you look even just at the actual sources that describe them you realize that the reason uh, much of a difference. These are mostly trends, tendencies that we uh, we spot uh, for the sake of like, look, this is an ancient, important time, and so we can get like for the few info that we have some interesting information, but it doesn't mean that the absolute divide, even at the time, was so so relevant. I'm glad because I see here that we have. Uh, 29 and with this one 30 videos about Hellenic warfare um, so we will again keep to talk about this not just about the classical one because there is a strictly Hellenic warfare also in Hellenistic times so the one of 
Greece essentially, even during the times of, of the Diadoko, in fact, recovered some troops of the same time um, later on. And um, for today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.